welcome to Watchtower History. Watchtower is following Henry Ford and his ideas during this period. Now, what were Henry Ford's ideas? Let's look a little bit at that. He had a philosophy of life that he created that was uh, at times inspirational and often and troublesome. Henry Ford was a great man, but not a good man. And, you know, was really a devout anti-Semite. So we can never mistake greatness in business for being a great person. The death goes after the death of one body. Excuse me, sir. And habits another. <clears throat> habits <clears throat> another. What is it? What is it worth? You'll see, sir. What? Good God of my. What is it, Henry? Somebody shot an archduke. They say it means war in Europe. Oh, Lord, no. War is a crime against humanity, and no one, no one should be involved. As for myself, I'd burn this plant right down to the ground before I'd do one lick of work for the war effort. And you can quote me on that, boys. Who would you say is behind this war? Who's behind it? Wall Street's behind it. Wall Street, the money lenders, warmongers, munition makers. Wall Street makes money over the graves of the common folk. Well, sir, President Wilson has been actively seeking peace. Mr. Patterson, Mr. Wilson has been talking peace for over a year now. The only trouble is nobody will listen to him. I think it's time that we put our hope somewhere else. What do you suggest, Mr. Ford? Well, I don't know if you heard the story about the old boy who wanted to be buried in his Model T. He said it always got him out of any hole he was ever in. I'm not saying the Model T is going to get us out of any hole called war, but, well, maybe it's time we think of something a little grander. And what might that something grander be? Human imagination. Imagination? Isn't that a somewhat irresponsible approach to something as serious as peace? Well, now, ma'am, irresponsible is a very interesting word. That's a word that's been thrown at me for years. Every time I wanted to lower the price of any of my cars, they called it irresponsible. Hell, ended up selling more cars and making more money. <laughs> Might we now hear your proposal for stopping this war? Yes, ma'am, I think it's time that some of our world leaders come forward and speak on behalf of the people against this damn war. And if they're not able to, or they're not willing to, by George, I'll do it myself. How do you plan to do that, Mr. Ford? Hell, I chartered a ship. I call it the peace ship. And I'm going to go over there and talk to those fellas. And you're all welcome to come with me. And if they'll listen to me, by George, I promise you, this war will be over before Christmas. Now, if you excuse me, I'll get back to work. Thanks a lot for coming, folks. I appreciate it. Well, now we got another one for page one, don't we? Good one. Good copy. Good copy. Hard copy. What do you think of that? Curious, sir, and curious, sir. They are not laughing at you, Henry Ford. I've read the papers, too. Yeah, well, they're calling me God's fool. What about the ones praising you for trying? The hero of a small man standing against the world for his principles? Yeah. Clara, it's not that I want anything that money can buy. I don't care about any material thing. All I want is an end to this damn war. And I want peace in the world. And I'd like to leave the world a little bit better off for my having been here. That's all. You have. Look look how successful you've been. Yeah, well, you wouldn't know it by the newspapers. All they're doing is ridiculing me all the time. And you know who they are. No. Well, you do. They're the same people I've been fighting all this time. The Wall Street brokers. Those fat cats. Rich bankers, munition makers. You know who they all are? No. They're Jews, most of them. Henry, well, they are, most of them. I won't listen well, to I'm that sorry, talk. they are, That's Clara. Not right. Well, I'm sorry. They are. And it's a damn conspiracy, too. And it's all there in that protocols of the, uh, of the elders of Zion thing. It's all there. It's a conspiracy. 
Well, if they think I have lived all my life to get to where I am, to be brought down by a bunch of tricksters, they're wrong. Wrong! Anti-Semitism in the United States reached its peak in the 1930s, as automobile manufacturer Henry Ford propagated anti-Semitic ideas in his newspaper, The Dearborn Independent. Ford and Adolf Hitler admired each other's achievements, and Hitler even kept a life-size portrait of Ford in his office. Two years before becoming the Chancellor of Germany in 1933, Hitler told a Detroit News reporter, I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration. Ford was later awarded the Grand Cross of the German Eagle, the highest medal awarded by Nazi Germany to foreigners. About the time that the first blast furnaces at the Rouge were being fired, Henry Ford again offered the world his thinking. But this time his thinking was tainted by anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism was very common in the farm communities of the Midwest at the end of the last century. It went with mistrust of the East, of the banking system, all sorts of things like this. And Henry Ford's prejudices were those of an ordinary Midwest farmer. The tragedy of it was that he had the money and the conceit to put his ideas on paper and actually publish his own magazine, which spread it all around America and, of course, made him a laughing stock. Through the Dearborn Independent, Ford blamed the Jewish people for everything from world war to short skirts, cheap movies, and jazz music. He loves to camp. He loves to be out in the wilderness. He loves rural America. But there's also an opportunity there. You have Henry Ford, the manipulator of the media. Henry Ford, the shrewd operator who understands how the modern world works. Ford had a lot of ideas. He had a lot of ideas about how to organize society about the best way to live, about proper roles of men and women. He had ideas about diet. He had ideas about smoking. He had ideas about exercise. And he also had ideas about Jews. In May 1920, Ford began publishing a series of articles in his hometown weekly the Dearborn Independent, which he had purchased a year and a half earlier. If there is one quality that attracts Jews, it is power, Ford wrote. It is not merely that there are a few Jews among international financial controllers. It is that these world controllers are exclusively Jews. Jews to Wall Street, he linked them to banks, and he blamed them for war. He basically began to blame Jews for all of the problems of the modern world. He lived in a culture in which all sorts of attributions were made to the Jews. The Jews are profiteers, the Jews cheat you in business. The Jews became the symbol of a world that was being manipulated and controlled. Ford ensured that his anti-Semitic message would be read in households across the nation. In addition to subscriptions, he distributed the Dearborn Independent through his more than 7,000 car dealerships. By 1926, circulation had reached 900,000. 
There are lots of small town newspapers that publish scurrilous anti-Semitic materials. So it wasn't unusual in that way. Uh, but what's notable about the Dearborn Independent is that there'd be stacks of them in a dealership in California, a dealership in Massachusetts, the dealership in Iowa. The American Jewish Committee, the Federal Council of Churches, and over 100 prominent leaders, including President Woodrow Wilson, condemned Ford's attacks but he was undeterred. The Jews are the scavengers of the world, Ford declared. Wherever there's anything wrong with a country, you'll find the Jews on the job there. Ford even reprinted the notorious Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The Tsars in Russia created this total fictional account of Jews conspiring to take over the world. And it's Ford that publishes it in America. What really matters about Henry Ford is that just he had so much power and so much cultural authority. And when a figure like Henry Ford sanctions this kind of thing, it has, you know, it legitimizes these ideas. A defamation suit by a Jewish lawyer forced Henry Ford to issue a public apology. After eight years of publishing the Dearborn Independent, he shut the paper down. Many Jewish organizations accepted Ford's apology as sincere, but those who knew him best did not. Behind closed doors, Ford remained convinced that Jews were at the heart of what he deemed the degeneration of American society. All right, so the restitution has another one, the June 7th, 1921 issue. And it says, all this is precisely what Henry Ford has been saying in the Dearborn Independent. These articles were written to stir up anti-Jewish sentiment in the United States. I'll skip down a little bit. Briefly, it appears that Jews are accused of employing methods and agencies the most vile and despicable to reduce the Gentiles to the level of brute beasts. When the Gentiles are reduced to this condition, they are to be ruled over by a Jewish king set up by the Jews themselves, they being, quote, God's chosen people, unquote, all nations thus becoming vassals to them, the Jews. And I'll skip down a little bit more. What is the basis of these anti-Jewish articles? It appears that somehow Henry Ford came into possession of 24 mysterious secret documents known as the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, these having been previously published and circulated in Great Britain and Russia as far back as 1906. They are supposed to be, in their present form, the notes of lectures delivered to an inner circle in France and Switzerland in 1896. In an article for the restitution, it is impossible to give details. If my readers will consult the issues of the Pathfinder for the months of January and February, the whole matter has gone into and explained, and as one writer has stated, quote, nothing like them in completeness of detail, in breadth of plan, and depth of grasp of the hidden springs of human action has ever been known. They are verily terrible in their mastery of the secrets of life, equally terrible in their consciousness of that mastery. What will bring this all about? The same thing that brought on the World War. And I'll skip down a little bit more. The Jews are a power in the land today. They, for their own interests, are skillfully manipulating every activity of human endeavor. They are excelling and forcing themselves to the front. But the article does say God is on their side. And then it quotes Matthew 12, 28 to 30. All right. So Henry Ford, if you had bought a Ford vehicle and he had sold 15 million, you know, by that time, 
you would have got a copy of his newspaper and a book that was published based on a series of articles that were published in that newspaper. And you could see some of the titles there in the Dearborn Independent, Are Jews Victims or Persecutors? Or the one below there, The International Jew, The World's Problem. Ford kept attacking the Jews in the Dearborn Independent. It literally became a racist, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic newspaper. And blaming the Jews on everything. Some other titles of articles. Angles of Jewish Influence in American Life. How the Jewish Question Touches the Farm. Jewish Control of the American Theater. Jewish Control of the American Press. Jewish Jazz. More on music becomes our national music. The Rise of the First Jewish Theatrical Trust. The Economic Plans of International Jews. The End of the Gentile Times. Now, with going on what we said so far, going back to what we showed you, what they wrote in the Golden Age, Henry Ford should read Rutherford's work. Okay, that that's saying we're peers. <laughs> we're on yeah. the same page. <laughs> hey, you should check out my work. I'm checking out yours. You know, it, it's a... The, the, it's a proud statement. He's not embarrassed. I mean, you're talking, he is fully on, Rutherford is fully on board with what Henry Ford is saying and doing. And we're going to lay out the evidence for that and the groundwork. We're just laying the foundation now, and we're going to go into the evidence here shortly. But what happened with Ford's writings, his anti-Semitic hatred, is that he chose not to copyright it. And so therefore it, it could be copied and distributed around the world as well. And so it got into the hands of a young German man in 1922 and, and they had it translated into German. So if you had gone into Germany and went to the Nazi office in 1922 to visit Hitler, you would have saw a framed photo of Henry Ford on his wall and copies of his book the international Jew all over the table. And here you can see a Photoshop I did of what this might have looked like. The Chicago Daily Tribune for Thursday, March 8th, 1923 has an article. Berlin hears Ford is backing Hitler. And there's a little paragraph in there that says, the wall beside his desk in Hitler's private office is decorated with a large picture of Henry Ford. In the antechamber, there's a large table covered with books nearly all of which are a translation of a book written and published by Henry Ford. If you ask one of Hitler's underlings for the reason of Ford's popularity in these circles, he will smile knowingly, but say nothing. The New York Times for Wednesday, December 20th, 1922, has an article. Heinrich Ford, Idol of Bavaria, Fascist Chief. And there's a little paragraph in there with a subheading of the international Jew. It says, The articles which Herr Hitler referred to evidently were from the Dearborn Independent. They had been published in two volumes by Hammer Verlag of Leipzig and are displayed in every bookshop in southern Germany. The title is The International Jew, with Henry Ford's name on the front page as the author. And then there's a quote here. It is not true that Mr. Ford is backing the fascist movement in Germany financially, said Herr Hitler. But Heinrich's picture occupies the place in honor of Herr Hitler's sanctorum. As a matter of fact, when the Nazis came to power in the 30s, that book was required reading in all of the schools. And so we're going to get a little more into those Hitler Ford connections in a little bit, but there's a little statement here, a little newspaper clipping that says about the Hitler youth. They were informed of increasingly impatient members of the international military tribunal today that a book he had said had been written by Henry Ford was influential in converting him to anti-Semitism. We regarded Henry Ford as a symbol, as a successful man and a person whose views should be taken seriously. Shurek said as he opened his defense against war crime charges, he said the book was entitled The International Jew. So let, let's 
again, summary, let's think about this. Ford writes a book, The International Jew, based on everything we anti semitisms that we said. Hitler gets a hold of it. They have it. They make it required reading for their for their German children. Okay. Again, Rutherford is, hey, you should check out my book. What, what did he want? Vindication right next to the, right? <laughs> the, the international Jew is required reading in, for German children. I mean, so this we're, we're talking, like Jeff said, we're bringing the groundwork down. And because people dispute an article here, one here is not, a, there's a lot out there. So we're, we're going to take a few minutes and go through a, a lot of connections and evidence. So in Hitler's Mein Kampf, he credits Henry Ford's International Jew as being influential on his thinking. This is, and we'll get more into this in the future, but this is part of the foundation for what Hitler did in Nazi Germany. And how did this discussion come about? Somehow, through my context, I was given one of these books of Henry Ford the international Jew, the world's foremost problem. And in looking at this, I realized, oh, that's interesting. That sounds like Rutherford. This sounds like Rutherford. This sounds like Rutherford. And so I started to search, well, what did Watchtower say about Henry Ford? And this is when we found the quote that said, Henry ought to read Judge Rutherford's work, Vindication. And so that started us down this entire path of, well, are there connections here? What were Ford's ideas? Were they the same as Rutherford's? How did it get to Hitler? All of these little historical threads that we started pulling on, now we're going to start to weave a tapestry and see how it all fits together. One of the history books that I found on this subject really helped open up the history of Henry Ford and what his background is and what's going on here. And this book is called Henry Ford and the Jews, The Mass Production of Hate by Professor Neil Baldwin. Henry Ford's book, The International Jew, is summarizing another anti-Semitic book called The Protocols of the Elder of Zion. Now, Hitler did not have a copy of the protocols in his library. Even after he had died, they never found any copies of the protocols, but they found all of the copies of Henry Ford's book, The International Jew, and was required reading. So that was really the foundation of their Jewish conspiracies was Ford's International Jew. And so how did Ford get it? So in late May or early 1920, Professor Baldwin says, a stenographer in Washington, D.C. made a copy of the complete text of the protocols uh, for a district supervisor for the Ford Motor Company operations in Delaware. On June 10th, an English version of the protocols was sent to Leobold. Now, Leobold was one of the editors of The Independent. He was also racist and anti-Semitic as well. On June 26, three days after the American Jewish Committee decided to maintain its low profile, the text of the protocols began to appear in the Dearborn Independent, starting with the Seventh Protocol, a ringing manifesto about the Jews' need to control the press throughout the world. Over the ensuing three months, the protocols was serialized and excerpt richly, freely, and systematically. On July 10th, the supermind Zionist Theodore Herzl was again vilified, as one of the authors of the modern version of the protocols. Now, Herzl was very um, instrumental in arranging um, Israel returning to their homeland and, and a lot of pro-Jewish and making Jewish state once again. So he was an important, if you didn't know that, Herzl is a very important Jewish person and conveniently being linked to this. And we're going to look at Herzl's work in a little bit. We also have that, The Jewish State by Herzl. And we're going to take a look at Herzl's diaries. But that's going to be in a little bit in the future, so stay tuned. The July 24th issue 
featured a primer-like introduction to the Jewish protocols, providing a brief history of their origins as rabbinical lectures, promulgating the secret Jewish Sanhedrin, and recommending them to all who are interested in the theory of Jewish world power. On August 7th, the Independent disparaged the purported statementship of the protocols, urging readers to exercise alertness in pursuing the documents because of the Jews' obsessive insistence upon their identity as the chosen people inspired cause for alarm. Now, isn't that what the early Watchtower movement, the, the Russell followers were calling it, the chosen people? And, and so again... You know, you can see how the Nazis are linking the two together. On October 14th, the focus shifted to an examination of the many ways in which the protocols advocated a breakdown of society by the Jews to wear out and exhaust the Gentiles by dissensions, animosities, feuds, and famine. And so Ford is blaming the Jews for all the problems of the world. His newspaper is blaming the Jews for everything. The Nazis blame the Jews for all their problems, all the problems of the world. That's why they were targeted. On August 21st, the editors soberly proceeded to a more detailed study of the connection between the written program of the documents and the actual program as it can be traced in real life. On September 11th, the theme of Jewish control of the press was traced through all 24 sections of the protocols. Then the September 18th issue issued a warning against the Jews' ambition to become rulers and laid out the potential threat of continuing to allow the flag of Palestine to fly without hindrance. And so they're making attacks in every single aspect and say, hey, the Jews are controlling everything. They're being blamed for everything. It says, Leobold wisely never copyrighted the international Jew, and therefore we had no lawful authority to stop anyone from publishing it themselves. The book went on to be translated into 16 different languages, including six editions in Germany alone between 1920 and 22. The infamous tract has remained in the public domain for more than 80 years. After all, the historian Norman Cohn has noted, the international Jew probably did more than any other work to make the protocols infamous. Contrary to inflated statements put forth by the Dearborn Independent Publishing Company about pent-up demand, the international Jew booklet series was disseminated as a way to remedy the fluctuations in the unsteady circulation of the independent. So what they were trying to do is find some way to boost the circulation of their newspaper. And so how do you do that? Advertise, advertise, advertise. You throw out a little sensationalism. And so that's what they were trying to do to boost the newspaper. And the extent that Ford went through to, to keep that message into the public... Um, according to Neil Baldwin, um, he made it a quota uh, for car car salesmen, um, made it a, the product like any other customer product, like a car. He, he turned it into a product, a, a, a solicitable item. Uh, so he he was um, he was out there to get his international Jew book out there. He wanted people to read that. They all of the Ford dealerships in the United States yep. worldwide had to distribute the book, yep. had to distribute the Dearborn Independent. And so there were millions of these cars. The book was spread everywhere. It it was spread very, very quickly. And because it wasn't copyrighted, more people could pick it up and reprint it and translate it into other languages. And so that's how it got into the Nazis' hands. And this is one of the foundations of their work that they did in trying to exterminate the Jews. Ford's Dearborn Independent asserted that the Bolshevik and Union leader are united under the flag of Judah in a global Jewish conspiracy. This is familiar because the Bible students were accused of the same thing by the Nazis. The Methodist minister here, John Webster Spargo, who was friendly enough with Ford that he traveled with Ford in 1915 on a peace ship that Ford chartered in an attempt to try and end the World War, who he blamed the Jews for starting anyway. Sparker's Christianity book took offense of Ford's low level that he descended to. He wrote a 150-page book, The Jew and American Ideas, as a defense against Ford's attack. The book was described as a plea for 
Christian civilization. And so there are those out there who are trying to counter Ford's work, but because of Ford's influence, his power, his money, his extent that he had in all of the dealerships and control of that and forcing them to distribute this magazine and this book, any attempts to stop it in its tracks was very, very minimal. January 1922, Walter Rathenau, Germany's Minister of Foreign Affairs, a Jew, is assassinated in Berlin by Hermann Fischer and an accomplice. At trial, they declare that Rathenau had to be killed because he was one of the elders of Zion. But who are the elders of Zion? According to this book, the elders of Zion are an elite group of Jewish leaders whose sole purpose is to take over the world by controlling the hearts, minds, and money of the Gentile world. And the book purports to quote directly from this invented group of Jewish leaders. Throughout all Europe and in other continents also, we must create riots, discord, and hostility, but we must use great cunning so the non-Jews will accept us as their benefactors and the saviors of the human race. These words are quoted from a mysterious little book that first starts circulating underground in Russia around 1897. It is titled, The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Its author and origin are unknown to this day. The Protocols, as the book is commonly called, contains the minutes of a clandestine meeting held by a group of Jewish leaders, the so-called Learned Elders of Zion. Through the minutes, readers learn that the elder's sole purpose is to infiltrate every corner of society with the ultimate aim of world conquest. The protocols of the elders of Zion purport to be the verbatim, word-for-word -word, uh, record of 24 speeches that were delivered by the uh, so-called chief sage of Zion to a secret meeting that took place in Switzerland in, in 1897. They describe a very uh, terrifying conspiracy to take over the world, to destroy particularly Christian nations, and to uh, build upon the ruins a Jewish empire ruled by a Jewish despot. From the moment of its publication, the protocol spread like an incurable virus across the European continent. Germany's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Walter Rathenau, is only one of millions of victims to come. When the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion come up at the passage from Tsarist to Bolshevik uh, Russia and all kinds of uh, Tsarist and uh, right-wingers are fleeing the, the country, and where do they go? They try to go uh, in Europe, uh, Germany, France, uh, to these places, and uh, uh, it would not be astonishing that some carry in their luggage a, uh, not only some souvenirs of their household, but also carry with them a, uh, a Russian version of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which for them is like no, a, a new gospel. Among the legions of royalists fleeing into Europe is Fyodor Vinberg. And if the Protocols is a disease, Vinberg is typhoid Mary. In 1920, Vinberg settles in Berlin and turns the Protocols over to Gottfried Zurbeek, who publishes the first editions of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion in German. It is an immediate bestseller and is reprinted five times within the first two years. And this is an age of crisis. Uh, the end of World War I, massive bloodshed, the dynasties disappearing, forms of government changing, borders changing, manners, morals. All of these things were very upsetting to a lot of people. After the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the anti-Bolsheviks tended to look at the Bolsheviks as Jews, and that gave great credibility to the protocols when they were noted a few years later. Aha, uh -huh. this terrible revolution has been fomented by Jews as a step towards implementing their control of the world. And Germans, still reeling from the effects of World War I, are easily swayed by the fallacious argument that if the Jews could do it to Russia, they would do it to Germany next. 
The Germans were also a particularly easy target because they already had a long tradition of anti-Semitic literature, conditioning readers to regard Jews as a threat to civilization. Perhaps the most virulent example is the 1878 edition of Deutsche Schriften, or German Writings, by Paul Bottiger. Bottiger blames the Jews for all the modern ills afflicting Germany. The only solution he tellingly suggests must be the extermination of the Jews. And so it is easy for the spreading virus of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to infect a weakened host. And once the disease of Jewish hatred consumes Germany, it grows stronger and spreads throughout Europe. On May 8, 1920, large excerpts from the Protocols are published in a Times of London editorial. The editorial asks rhetorically, what are these protocols? Are they authentic? If so, what malevolent assembly concocted these plans and gloated over their exposition? Have we, by straining every fiber of our national body, escaped a Pax Germanica only to fall into a Pax Judaica? Less than a week after their appearance in England, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion begins to reach the American masses, too, and all because of the single-minded anti-Semitic fervor of one of America's greatest heroes, Henry Ford. Between May and October of 1920, Ford writes a weekly article about the Protocols in his newspaper, The Dearborn Independent, but he doesn't stop there. Henry Ford distributes those articles to his automobile showrooms across the country for the benefit of prospective car buyers. In November of the same year, Henry Ford publishes the protocols and his own anti-Semitic diatribe in a four-volume bound set entitled The International Jew, the World's Foremost Problem. Half a million copies are distributed in the United States, and Ford underwrites the publication of European editions in 16 languages. Asked by the New York World in 1921 why he was publishing the protocols, Henry Ford said, the only statement I care to make about the protocols is that they fit in with what is going on. They have fitted the world situation up to this time, they fit it now. He found an answer to many of the questions he had. Given his means and given his prestige, he was in a position to endorse it and make it available to a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have seen it. This gave it a legitimacy in American life in the 1920s. It's not what Ford had to say, basically, but who he was that is really irrelevant here. Uh, this is a hugely successful, much admired man. And one did not have to read the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to say, well, if Henry Ford is backing it this way and losing money uh, in the process, uh, lost uh, several million dollars uh, publishing this, uh, his four-volume book, uh, there must be something to it. Henry Ford's campaign on behalf of the Protocols is a flop in the United States. Americans by and large just do not buy the theory that there is a Jewish world conspiracy. But Ford's vitriol in the international Jew is reaching millions of people in Europe, and rising young politicians are beginning to respond to the lies put forth in the Protocols. In particular, a young man with lofty political ambitions is fascinated with Ford's insistence that the Jewish conspiracy is real. His name is Adolf Hitler. Hitler is said to have had a, uh, a picture of the heroic Heinrich Ford in his bedroom. Uh, the millionaire, the self-made man. By 1921, the protocols have been around for nearly a quarter of a century. What started as a hoax perpetrated by one political faction for a very limited purpose is now accepted as fact on two continents. In September of 1935, the Nuremberg Laws are enacted. These strip Jews of their citizenship and give authorities the power to arrest them and ship them out of their communities. And the Protocols is used again and again as justification for such flagrant disregard for human rights. Among those most responsible for keeping the Protocols at the forefront is Julius Streicher, a notorious anti-Semite and a newspaper publisher. Julius Streicher was one of the most unpleasant Nazis. Even his fellow Nazi brethren didn't like him very much. 
But Stryker had one very strong thing in his favor. He was one of Hitler's few close buddies, if you will. He'd gained that by merging his own political party with Hitler's in 1922, which at that time almost doubled the size of the Nazi movement, and it earned Hitler's lifelong gratitude. Stryker publishes Der Sturmer, a popular right-wing political newspaper. Week in and week out, Der Sturmer's half million readers are treated to hyperbolic articles about the world Jewish conspiracy. In October of 1938, five years into the Nazi's master plan, the rhetoric in Der Sturmer turns into a call to action. The Jew, Stryker writes, are bacteria, vermin, and pests that cannot be tolerated. For reasons of cleanliness and hygiene, we must make them harmless by killing them off. I'd say that the protocols had a very major impact in moving anti-Semitism from a protest movement to a movement of power. I would not say it was the only factor or that it wouldn't have happened without it, but it was certainly a significant element. The Nazi propaganda machine under Joseph Goebbels keeps up a steady drumbeat of anti-Jewish hatred. Perhaps the most notorious example of anti-Semitic propaganda is a 1940 film entitled The Eternal Jew. At its core, this film tells the story found within the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. It's a pseudo-documentary showing the Jews engaged in all kinds of evil things. They never directly mention the protocols, but the line that Hitler takes in that film is very much influenced by the protocols. For example, it shows the Jews engaged in a sinister campaign to take over the world. They're compared to rats who spread around the world from their origins in Asia. It also does a great deal with the Jews and their financial power. The protocols suggest financially the Jews are going to control the world. The film The Eternal Jew spends a great deal of time doing exactly that. As Hitler's blitzkrieg advances across Europe, country after country falls to the Third Reich. By 1941, the vast majority of European Jews are under Nazi control. One of the darkest chapters in human history begins. One historian said that Germans knew enough to know they didn't want to know any more. But of course that means you know something. And you've got to have a reason for not wanting to know any more. The protocols were one of those reasons. It was a warrant for closing one's eyes to what was going on. In October of 1943, Heinrich Himmler, the chief of Hitler's SS and an architect of the final solution, offers a sobering rationale for the Holocaust. The paranoid apocalypse has a statement here that says that the Federal Churches of Christ condemned the anti-Semitic articles in Ford's Dearborn Independent. So while there were some denominations who accepted the ideas, not just Watchtower, as, as we're seeing, there were some who opposed it. And so Ford responded, arguing that the Jews are the scavengers of the world. Wherever there's anything wrong with a country, you'll find that the Jews are on the job there. Again, blaming the Jews for everything, just as the Nazis had done, blaming the Jews for everything. So remember, in the First World War, Henry Ford chartered a peace ship because he thought he could go to Europe and try to convince the countries there that were fighting to stop. And so there's a book here, The History of a Lie, The Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion by Herman Bernstein. And it says, Ford invoked the peace ship's mission five years earlier. He recalled that one of the prominent Jews on the ship had actually told him of the power of the Jewish race, of how they controlled the world through their control of gold and that the Jew and no one but the Jew could end the war. The following month, Ford would identify the, the Jew by name as the journalist Herman Bernstein, author of a recent expose of the Protocols of Elders of Zion, The History of a Lie. Bernstein later successfully sued Ford for libel. So Ford lied about it, and he got caught in court because of it. Nazi Germany's semi-official and fiercely anti-Semitic newspaper, Der Sturmer, warned of a Jewish program for world domination in its 1934 issue. The article titled, Who is the Enemy? Blame the Jews for Destroying Social Order and Claim that the Jews Wanted War 
while the rest of the world wanted peace. And so you can see some of the artwork that's used around this time period. It looks similar to some of the Watchtower artwork to me. You can see the dwarf against the giants. Roosevelt, American patriot, Lincoln, liberator of slaves in Washington, the father of America, gazed down upon Henry Ford holding a sack labeled anti-Semitism. Ford and Uncle Sam scale. Even with the Klan, he doesn't outweigh American freedom. The Klan's toy, the papers on the table next to the Klansmen read, Elders of Zion. Henry Ford for president. Accusations against the Jews and down with the Jews. And so the anti-Semitists, the white supremacists, picked up Ford's material and were using that for their hate speech and their rhetoric. The Ku Klux Klan was involved in this. And so if you remember, we had this discussion about Watchtower and the Klan. They have some similar foundation. They've got some similar ideas, similar ideas to the Nazis as well. Professor Baldwin continues and is showing a reprint of a Heinrich Ford article with admiring comments by Adolf Hitler that was published in the Tribune. So Hitler loved the Ford material. It says, if a person were summoned from the waiting room into Hitler's private office, he would be somewhat taken aback to see hanging on the wall beside the massive desk, a large portrait of Henry Ford. Why here and why now? 10 years before Hitler assumed the chancellorship. Again, this is the foundation of much of what Hitler and the Nazis were doing in Nazi Germany. No wonder when Hitler came to power, they immediately went after the Jews and the Bible students on the same day because they grouped them into the same Jewish conspiracy. Professor Baldwin says that many of Adolf Hitler's immutable hypnotic fixations about Jews and other social and economic matters were inspired by the imagination of a man who has been called the Fuhrer's chief ideologist and closest co-thinker, the reserved, dogmatic, fair-haired, and arrogant Alfred Rosenberg. Born into a bourgeois household in the Baltic region of Raval, trained in architecture in Moscow, the young man fled from Russia during the revolution, worked up in a, worked in a Munich soup kitchen, and then joined the National Socialist German Workers' Party as a self-declared, self-defined fighter against Jerusalem in 1920. The following year, Rosenberg was appointed editor of the Racial Observer, a weekly Munich gossip sheet rescued from near bankruptcy and purchased by the Nazis when Hitler, desperate to have his newspaper, found out that the tabloid was in danger and falling into the hands of Bavarian separatists. Wanting the paper to achieve broader circulation and appear in larger American-style format, Hitler authorized the acquisition of two rotary presses by February 1923. That newspaper had become a full-fledged daily. It served from the outset as an ongoing, expurgated record of Hitler's public speeches, transcribed as they were uttered before the ever-growing crowds in the early years of his ascendancy to leadership in the Nazi party. This is during the period Hitler is having the international Jew of Ford's newspaper reprinted and spread throughout Germany. This is the foundation of their work. Oh, uh, we did a little field trip, uh, Jeff and I, with this. Um, we uh, there's two museums. There's the Dearborn in Dearborn, Michigan, and there's Henry Ford's uh, Florida residence uh, that he shared in with his friend Thomas Edison. And it's it, it's very interesting. The Dearborn. Michigan Ford Museum acknowledges as a, as a painful part in their history Henry Ford's anti-Semitism and and in publications against the Jews. Um, the one I went to the one in Florida, and they specifically it was it was funny. There's nothing anywhere near related to international Jew, and I asked a couple of the employees there. And I, and I targeted ones who were older, looked like they'd been there a while, supervisory, and they've never even heard of anything about this, which I found interesting uh, <laughs> because it is very well publicized. But once again, history is written by those who <laughs> conquer. It's, it's his museum, so he's putting out there, or the family, uh, or Ford Corporation, you know, is keeping 
you know, that in there, but, but that is out there. And I didn't know about this either until we started researching this. So a lot of this is all new, what we're uncovering in our research, but you know, on the good side of the current Henry Ford company, they acknowledge that and that they've tried to make reparations for that. They tried to try and help Jewish people where needed and try to combat anti-Semitism now going forward. But I was getting to the point reading this is like, oh, I, I'll never buy a Ford vehicle ever again. Mm -hmm. This is really angering me, really making me emotionally sick, very ill. Just all this hatred that does caused the, the deaths of millions. Does the Watchtower Society follow that same path? Something to consider. Professor Baldwin continues. Over the five-year span from 1919 to 1924, Alfred Rosenberg amassed an influential body of work dealing with the facts of Jewish identity inside the Bolshevik Revolution, the yoke of Jewish mammonism, the wire pullers in the Zionist conspiracy, the biological pairs posed by the Jewish race threatening the glorification of the Aryan, and above all else, the validity of the protocols. He took great pains to bring them up to date through extensive commentaries within his book, The Protocols in Jewish World Policy, in 1923, which went through three editions within the year and made a particularly strong impression upon Hitler. Rosenberg's staunch advocacy of the Protocols from the first moment he arrived in Munich led to Hitler's acceptance of their authenticity as one of Nazism's core texts in the pages of Mein Kampf. Just like the Dearborn Independent, Hitler's newspaper, guided by Rosenberg, found distribution outside its provincial boundaries, but remained a form that was never able to turn a profit. All right. And so that was the same problem that they had here with the Dearborn Independent. I mean, how can you read this hate speech and think, or even write the hate speech and think that people were going to want to buy that? Dietrich Eckhart's collaboration with Hitler provided evidence of the latter's awareness of the ideas of Henry Ford. The pamphlet published in Munich in March of 1924 had been roughly in incompletely drafted by the two men in October and early November the preceding fall, just before they were both arrested as a consequence of the failed Munich Beer Hall putsch. Hitler was released 13 months later. Eckhart, already seriously ill when he entered prison, died of heart failure and was buried in the Bavarian Alps. With Eckhart's prompting, Hitler repeatedly imports the words of Luther and Schopenhauer, defining the Jews as the dregs of mankind, a beast, the great masters of the lie. It applies without exception to every Jew equally, whether high or low, stock exchange tycoon or rabbi, baptized or uncircumcised. Orlando J. Smith Henry Ford's long-ago inspiration had also referenced Schopenhauer for authority, accusing the Jews of having exercised spiritual ideas from Europe. In his short view of Great Questions, the pamphlet that so affected the young automaker in 1901. And so some of Ford's influences from his youth were anti-Semitic. And this book goes into a lot of that. Now, I, it, it's irony. If memory serves me correct, I'm pretty sure of this. Um, it was during that time that Hitler was sent to jail. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, he exactly. wrote Mein Kampf in jail. It was written in jail, which, which is they were punishing him for his <laughs> idea of what he was doing. And yet he used the time that they paid him more or less for room and board to uh, come up with that mind camp. Hitler's interned 40 miles west of Munich in the picturesque town of Landsberg. And he's treated like royalty in exile. With his newfound celebrity status, Hitler uses his prison stay as a PR opportunity, inviting his own photographer to record his incarceration. It's just one of a number of privileges he's given behind bars. 
Hitler would later make out that his time in Landsberg prison was pretty hellish. But in fact, the truth was quite the opposite. He can walk around the gardens as and when he likes. Some of his cronies are allowed to come in and out and visit him. This isn't a prison. This is a kind of nationalist holiday camp. It was very comfortable. He had his own favourite wicker chair. He had windows to look out of. And he actually grew quite porky. He ate quite a lot of meat. He drank quite a lot of alcohol. He has three-course meals that are brought in. Parties even go on inside his quarters. He was able to fraternise with friends and he was able to listen to music. Hitler's music of choice is Wagner. He had access to a wind-up gramophone. The old large 78s would be at his disposal. He adored Wagner, and even as a teenager, he would spend his last Grosjeans, his last shillings, on going to the opera in Vienna and listening to Wagner operas. For the Austrian-born Hitler, Wagner embodies everything he loves about his adopted country, Germany. It's the nature of the music that took Hitler. The grandness of the music, the sheer expansion of it, the, the, the themes themselves, taking on the gods of the great traditions of German culture. It's grand, it's ambitious, it's hugely confident. He saw in Wagner inspirational content. Stirred by this sense of nationalism and by the works of an array of philosophers he spends hours absorbing, Hitler decides to set down on paper his own beliefs. If you're going to be a national socialist party, you're competing with the Communist Party, and they have a book on which they base their ideas, which is Das Kapital by Karl Marx. So he decides that the Nazi party needs a philosophical tract where he can outline the ideology of the party. Imprisoned with him at Landsberg is one of Hitler's co-conspirators from the Beer Hall Putsch, Rudolf Hess. Now acting as his private secretary, Hess takes dictation from Hitler day after day as he embarks on the book which will define Nazism. My struggle, or Mein Kampf, is supposed to be a deep personal statement from Hitler. It's the man talking about himself and his ideas for the first time in a systematic way, and that's why it's so significant. Distorted tales about Hitler's childhood, his early youth in Vienna, and his war experiences are mixed together with political and racial theorizing. But the concepts within it aren't his own. Mein Kampf really is based on a number of ideas that he's heard. It's kind of a melting pot of ideas robbed from philosophy, taken from, you know, the back of a, of a, of a beer mat. Really, it's a kind of mishmash. At its heart is Hitler's belief that the Aryan German people are the natural master race. and that Germany's biggest enemy are the Jews. The personification of the devil as the symbol of all evil assumes the living shape of the Jew. Hitler believes that the Jews are a genetically inferior race and that they're to blame for everything that's wrong with Germany including the country's capitulation in the First World War and its economic plight. He is and remains the typical parasite, 
a sponger who, like a noxious bacillus, keeps spreading as soon as a favorable medium invites him. On top of this, he blames them for communism. In Bolshevism, we must see the attempt undertaken by the Jews in the 20th century to achieve world domination. He goes his way, the way of sneaking in among the nations and boring from within with lies and slander, poison and corruption. Mein Kampf even contains a frightening warning about Hitler's intentions. The whole text is shot through with incredibly violent language. Page after page, we get the language of eradication, annihilation, destruction, extermination. Hitler believes the only way to solve the Jewish problem is to destroy the Jewish parasite. There can be no doubt that if Hitler comes to power, there is going to be some kind of a reckoning with the Jews. But, you know, if you look at the history, he had kind of these cushy quarters. It wasn't really a prison. It was like a nice hotel he was put in. He was allowed to have visitors, had a typewriter. I mean, really. <laughs> and, and that goes to show, I'm glad you said that. Um, that goes to show a lot of people in German ha had those ideas at the time. It wasn't just Hitler. You know, he was he was the catalyst to bring them together, but they were feeling in, in a lot that he so they sympathized with him in that. And it, it is comical. I went I was in Germany uh, quite a few years back and you're wandering the tourist areas. You're not you know, you don't speak the language. So you don't understand where you're going, what everything is. I went in the equivalent of what would have probably been like a a head shop, a record store a pawn shop type thing. And I didn't realize it at the time, but there were all kinds of stickers that you could buy mind camp, you know, all, mm. all, all kinds of um, Nazi symbols. And that was actually against the law at the time to be selling stuff like that. And I told this story before in another discussion, I got on the subway and, and I think it was Berlin or Munich. I, I can't remember. Um, there was a, a very Aryan looking individual dressed like a Nazi SS guard with a book, the fourth Reich. So th there were people in just ripe, ready for Hitler to come along and, and lead them. You, you had mentioned his arrest and imprisonment. And, and this statement from professor Baldwin mentions that it says midway through the joint diatribe, Hitler turned his attention towards America and the special problems there involving the attitude of faithless German Jews toward the country where they live. And the fact that they have united themselves with the rest of the world's Jews towards the ruin of Germany. And as the American Ford well knew and had lately written, it's clear that they have had America by the throat for quite a while. And so they're even quoting Ford in these German documents, but it says during the year spent in a comfortable room at Landsberg prison, 50 miles West of Munich, his university paid for by the state, Hitler had plenty of free time to read, reflect, and apply the many valuable lessons he had learned and acquired during the previous four years from this Rosenberg and Eckhart. So I'm glad that confirms what I said. I, I didn't read that when we were reviewing this. I didn't get that far. So good, good. Because of what Henry Ford had published in his newspaper and the influence that it had on the Nazis, and their ideology, in 1938, Henry Ford is given the medal of the cross, the German cross. This is the highest medal a non-German citizen could get. And why? It's because of Henry Ford's book, The International Jew. Wow. That they had considered so influential. Henry Ford should read Judge Rutherford's vindication book. Yes, exactly. And so, again, it brings us back to the ideology between Ford and Rutherford. They're pushing the same principles, the same ideas. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit. Professor Baldwin says, in light of these developments, Henry Ford was delighted 
when on the occasion of his 75th birthday, July 30th, 1938, he became the first American recipient of the Grand Service Cross of the Supreme Order of the German Eagle. Contrary to some published accounts, the presentation of this award, created by Hitler in 1937, as the highest honor given to Germany to distinguished foreigners, was not a surprise. It was announced at Ford's birthday dinner before an invited audience of more than 1,500 prominent Detroiters. William J. Cameron made the keynote speech. Now, Cameron was the editor of Ford's paper. When the Dearborn Independent was shut down in the late 1920s, Cameron left and joined a white supremacist movement. So we'll get into his story a little bit later on. But Cameron praised the Ford influence on the engineering and production upon society. And so they, the pretty much the Nazis, the Nazis here are awarding Ford for his work because it was really the basis of the Nazi ideology. And just um, uh, let me interject here. Um, a lot of our slides that we're showing now are showing uh, mainly Neil Baldwin's work, Henry Ford and the Jews. Uh, everything that we've got through here came through primary sources that were fact-checked. And we also have other documentation from primary resources that we're going to be showing, direct newspaper quotes and all that. So there is more evidence than, than just on these past few slides that you've been seeing. And, and when we start, we're going to start looking at Ford's Dearborn Independent. We're going to be looking at the international Jew and we're going to start looking at that ideology. So very directly, it'll be the sources that Ford had written for his paper. Yeah, not just this. Directly book. at Ford himself. Yeah. So, all right. This is just the outline of Ford's history. When Hitler comes to power in 1933, within a few days, they're immediately going after the Jews and the Bible students because they believed this idea that there was a worldwide Jewish conspiracy. And literally is based off of Ford's book that they had translated into German. All right, and so there was a document that actually shows how the, it says the articles become books and the books becomes Nazi pro propaganda. And show it, it shows how the Nazis were using Ford's book to sell this Hitler idea about the Jews, this, this racism against the Jews, that the Jews deserve to be killed because of this so-called conspiracy. All right, and so we're going to look at now how Watchtower viewed Henry Ford in some of these articles. 